History as it happens, January 23rd, 2024. Beyond Taiwan. The Generalissimo, here with his wife, predicts that the communists who control the mainland will not last long. Chiang Kai-shek reviews the armed forces of nationalist China on his island stronghold, Formosa. Carries on with feverish preparations for repelling the long-expected communist invasion from the mainland. The United States recognizes the government of the People's Republic of China as a sole legal government of China. Within this context, the people of the United States will maintain cultural, commercial, and other unofficial relations with the people of Taiwan. And a resounding victory for the ruling party candidate in Taiwan's presidential elections, seen as a blow to China. Taiwanese voters defy Chinese intimidation, handed another presidential victory to the Democratic Progressive Party. The election confirming the vibrancy of Taiwan's democratic institutions, while its communist neighbor across the strait looked on in disapproval. What the election means for Taiwan, East Asia, and the world, next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. It does have global implications. There's the Taiwan democratization story. It's a really important uh, story and and, uh, symbolically important in a region that is going to be the most dynamic economic area in the future and, and driving growth. Uh, We've seen setbacks for democracies around the world, and the fact that Taiwan's democracy has prevailed even under the stresses and pressures that it's faced uh, from Beijing is striking. Nixon's opening to China in the early 1970s was of historic importance. It began a process of restoring ties between the U.S. and China, ruptured by the communist victory of 1949, a process that reached its fulfillment under President Carter mid-December 1978 from the Oval Office, the announcement to normalize relations. The United States of America and the People's Republic of China have agreed to recognize each other and to establish diplomatic relations as of January the 1st, 1979. But when it comes to Taiwan, the origins of today's conflict lie, as mentioned, in 1949, when the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek fled the mainland to what was then called Formosa, now Taiwan, as this British Pathé newsreel showed audiences. General Chiang Kai-shek returns to power as president of nationalist China. He takes office in exile at Formosa, island fortress, 90 miles from the Chinese mainland. The Generalissimo, here with his wife, predicts that the communists who control the mainland will not last long. Meanwhile, 100,000 picked troops... And we can trace the origins of today's conflict to 1979, when the U.S. recognized Communist China, the PRC, People's Republic of China, capital Beijing, and de-recognized Taiwan, whose official name is, to this day, Republic of China, capital Taipei. But in the interest of clarity for this podcast, we're going to call the country Taiwan. And this is where we get the One China policy. Since 1979, the view from Washington is the PRC is China, but the U.S. does not recognize Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan. It merely acknowledges Beijing's claim to it. The United States recognizes the government of the People's Republic of China as a sole legal government of China. Within this context, the people of the United States will maintain cultural, commercial, and other unofficial relations with the people of Taiwan. Taiwan voters have elected pro-sovereignty candidate Lai ching te also known as William Lai, as their next president, securing a historic third term for the ruling Democratic Progressive Party. Thanks to the Taiwanese people for writing a new chapter in our democracy, said Lai at an election night victory rally. We have shown the world how much we cherish our democracy. We are telling the international community that between democracy and authoritarianism, we still stand on the side of democracy. As far as the Chinese Communist Party is concerned, Lai is a scoundrel, his party a mob of secessionists, pretty much. Under Xi Jinping, the CCP has threatened to reunify Taiwan with the mainland as part of Xi's mission for national rejuvenation. A word about language here, the People's Republic of China, or PRC, prefers reunify because, in its view, Taiwan has always been part of China. 
In a moment, we're going to speak to Carla Freeman, a senior expert on China at the United States Institute of Peace here in Washington. But first up, the Washington Times reporter Andrew Salmon, who's based in Seoul and was in Taiwan covering the election. Andrew Salmon, hello, my friend. Hello. Hey. It's good to have you back. You know, trying to get you on this podcast is difficult only for one reason. You are 14 hours ahead of me in Seoul. So I've got to get up really early and you've got to stay up really late because if we tried it the other way around, it probably wouldn't work. What do you think of that? <laughs> You're absolutely correct. I'm much more of a, uh, you know, a vampiric sort of night bird than a, <laughs> an early morning, you know, the worm that gets eaten by the bird or whatever it is that wakes up very early. Well, you've been very busy too. Mm. Traveling. You were in Taiwan for the election. I want to talk about yeah. the mood, the mood inside the country. What were Taiwanese talking about? Were they aware in your conversations with them of all the global attention on their election? Yes, very much so. I mean, my two key takeaways with this. One is that the Taiwanese want you there. You know, the Taiwanese are very, very keen to be to be part of the wider democratic world. And, and why wouldn't they? Taipei is not like Shanghai or Seoul or Tokyo or Hong Kong. It doesn't feel like one of these giant Asian metropolises. It's just a bit more laid back. It's a bit more chill. And people have got time for you. Taxi drivers will say, welcome to Taiwan, you know, in English. And that's the only English they speak. The night before the election, me and three colleagues were at a rally for the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, which is the, the, the ruling party. Just won their an historic third consecutive term in the presidential office. So I was at this rally and, you know, there are, I guess, tens of thousands of heaving people, you know, screaming, yelling and, and rah rahing as their candidates spoke. And we were sort of in the crowd taking pictures and, and getting the vibe. And then we were going to move out of the crowd, having got the vibe to do, you know, street interviews. And it's not easy to move through these crowds. And I've done it a million times before across Asia. But in this particular crowd, there were three of us and an interpreter, and we were we were sort of pushing through the crowd, and the waves parted, if you know what I mean. And people were saying in English, oh, welcome to Taiwan. Thank you for coming, and sort of slapping us on the back and eventually actually helping us over a police barrier to escape this huge crowd, this huge rally. I've never actually, I don't think off the top of my head, I, I've really experienced that before. My colleagues who were in Korea in the 1980s, when Korea was sort of fighting for its democracy, said they'd felt these expressions of, of gratitude towards the foreign press. I felt that in Taiwan. I've got to admit, I was actually deeply moved. The opposition party, the nationalists, the Kuomintang, going all the way back to Chiang Kai-shek, of course, that was during the days of military dictatorship in Taiwan. They are a democratic party now. They're the main opposition party, uh, led by yes. Hu Yu-e, came in second, 33% of the vote, followed by Ko wen Ji of the populist Taiwan People's Party with 26% of the vote. But the DPP lost its majority in parliament. This wasn't uh, an election to determine whether Taiwan would continue to be a democracy. It's not like the opposition parties are saying we're going to end democracy no, as we know it. Absolutely So, not. Absolutely So not. what is your takeaway as far as the stakes there domestically? I mean, what did this election turn on? Yeah, I mean, this is a good question. I mean, the day I arrived, I sort of, I reflected what everyone else was reporting, saying that, you know, like every election, the pivot here, what, what it really turns on, it's not a foreign policy issue. Let's call China a foreign policy issue. It's domestic issues. But talking to the voters, talking to people at the rallies, talking to people all around Taipei, I think that's wrong. And I'm not an, a China specialist. I'm not a Taiwan specialist. But, for example, out of the 13 or 14 voters I spoke to on election day outside polling stations in three different parts of Taipei, two-thirds mentioned China as, as the big issue in this election. And again, let me make clear to you, to go behind the scenes, the first question that I posed to all these voters was, to you, what is the main issue in this election. Two thirds said the China issue. So my sense, at least my sense, polling data may conflict was that this was very much about China. My sense of 
of talking to people and also going up to Red Beach, the key invasion location northwest of, of Taipei, was that, oddly enough, this island is, particularly compared to, to where I am now, which is South Korea, this island is defenseless. So the DPP wants to continue to have strong relations with the West, build up their military confrontation with China. I mean, that's not what they're looking for here, right? I mean, the other two parties want to have... If you actually listen to them, that's not what they're talking about. That confrontational rhetoric is coming from the other side of the strait. I'll give you one example. The former global editor of the Global Times, which is this rather hysterical Beijing media, made a long post on Weibo, which is a, a Chinese social media, which someone was kind enough to it to translate for me. The standout point that was made in this long post, which was frankly a rant, was, well, Taiwan has voted, but we have to be, be serious about this. Their votes don't really matter. And I thought, good God, you know, China, you're not getting this. To me, the big picture in this election is ex-Taiwan. It, it's regional. Uh, this is my job, right? I mean, yeah. China in the last three, four years has lost South Korea. The South Korean government today is now building an alliance with Japan, the former bete noir of South Koreans. And poll data makes clear that South Koreans now despise Chinese more than they do Japanese. That's a massive shift. That's amazing. For about the last three, four, four years, Basically, this is the long-term run of the premiership of the late Shinzo Abe in Japan. The Japanese have been turning against China to the point that in the last two years, they're actually shifting troops from Hokkaido, which is in north of Japan, to the Ryukyu chain, which is the southern chain directly north-northeast of Taiwan. They're fortifying that area. Look at the Philippines. In the last year and a half, after the Rodrigo Duterte president ended and Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos came in, they've shifted towards the USA because they're fed up with what they're hearing and seeing from China. You've now got US troops rotating through northern Luzon, which dominates the strait between Taiwan and the Philippines. So, And, of course, we've now got the third consecutive term for the DPP in Taiwan. This has not happened in Taiwanese democratic history before, that one party wins the presidency three times in a row. So what does this tell you about Chinese foreign policy, about the Chinese Communist Party's overall approach to its neighbors? Economic coercion. It's not working. I was going to say the other two parties, the opposition parties, want to have a more accommodating relationship with China as they had in the past. I mean, the Kuomintang had the presidency prior to these three consecutive terms of the DPP, and they got along a little bit better with China. From what I can tell from what I've read, independence is not a popular position among Taiwanese, regardless of political party. They want something in between. They want to maintain the status quo and have a a better status quo, short of independence, but also not surrendering to Chinese economic coercion. Because we have to remember, and obviously you know this, Andrew Salmon, all of these nations we're talking about here have economic and cultural ties with China, even if they have icy diplomatic relations. That's true. But I mean, and I need to report this, but if we look at last year's trade figures from South Korea, we learn that as of last year, America has replaced China as the number one consumer of South Korean exports. For the first time since 2003, Japan is de-investing from China. And, and, you know, clearly the Taiwanese are are deeply embedded, not just in China, but in the global supply chain. So, again, I think the CCP are shooting themselves through the foot with their policies. Let's talk about independence for, for Taiwan. And let me be brutally, savagely, barbarically frank. This is an independent nation by every standard. It has its own government. It has its own currency. It has its own central bank. It has its own economy brimming with important global brands. Um, It has its own armed forces. Basically, this is a country that's independent, except for one thing. It has virtually no membership in any international 
organization, the UN, the WHO, that you know you can go through. Yeah, only about a dozen why countries not? even recognize Taiwan, right? So. Why is that? Because of Chinese choose one of two words, influence or bullying. And so what does that say to your average Taiwanese? Yeah. You know, what does this tell them? They're not talking about breaking away from the mainland. That happened in 1948. And your point about Japan de-investing in China is really fascinating because I just finished reading a book by the historian Nelson Lichtenstein about capitalism, globalization in the 1990s, where nations and multinational corporations were banging down the door to get into the Chinese market. I mean, there was this belief, which... That's 30 years ago. I mean, these are really very, very, very big picture trends, and the history is still not written. From the, I'd say from the late 80s, but from the early early to mid 90s, you had, as China gradually cracked open its doors, Western corporations were beating down the door. I mean, the first wave were those who were wanting to sell to China on the belief that if one Chinese person buys one of my widgets, I'm going to sell a billion widgets. And the second wave was, of course, those who are saying, you know, China's got great infra, it's plugged into the global trading economy, it's got good disciplined labor, let's manufacture in China, it's the workshop of the world. We've learned since that that is not a great winning strategy for, for too many global companies in the sense that there's been massive theft of intellectual property, there's been an enormous amount of, at least if you listen to business, unfair trade, preferential treatment, to the point that many, many companies that I speak to are extraordinarily cynical about modern China now. And that's a massive reversal. So are we at an inflection point? I don't know. But it's, and particularly being based here in South Korea, where the Chinese used economic retaliation in 2016 against a political decision by the South Korean government, albeit who was sort of arguably connected at the hip to the American government to deploy THAAD, which was the uh, a high altitude air defense system against North Korean missile attacks. But of course, the Chinese said quite rightly, this system's radars can snoop deep into China. But the result of that was a dry up of Chinese tourism, a clampdown on cultural exports like K-pop in China, and essentially the ruination of the Lotte Group's operations in China. Lotte Group actually offered the terrain on which this system, this American system was was established. So again, I, I, I do feel that China had this extraordinary global economic potential and it squandered it or is squandering in recent years to the point that even, even those sort of small and medium companies who may feel disconnected from geopolitics, are purely basing their investment decisions on economics. A large number of them are shifting now from China, not necessarily due to the political risk, but to the, the various issues within China, notably the rise of the middle class. They're moving their manufacturing operations to, to Vietnam, to Bangladesh and other places where you get maybe more bang for your buck. Yeah, last question, Andrew Salmon. Prior to the election, the Chinese conducted shows of force. They increased the shows of force with naval warships, jet fighters buzzing around the waters in the air around Taiwan, you know, to send a message. How do ordinary Taiwanese, what do ordinary Taiwanese think of all of this? Uh, it's something that it's hard for me to relate to. Yeah. You know, uh, when I go to vote, I am not worried about uh, Canada, you know, trying to intimidate me. You know, you know right. what I mean. Right. Uh, how long have you got? I could talk about this for hours because <laughs> this was my, the main interest in my trip to Taiwan, which was merely a week. But a, a few points. One, there's clearly a growing interest in Taiwanese for civil defense stroke survival skills. Taiwanese, there's no way they can earn a gun. There's no gun ownership here. You can get an airsoft. I'm told that even gangsters in Taiwan, when they're, they're going to underground arms dealers to, to get hold of a pistol for a hit, these arms dealers will say, well, hang on, I think you need a low caliber weapon. You don't need 20 rounds. You need you know, three or four rounds. <laughs> this is indicative of how anti-gun Taiwan is. So you can't raise 
a citizen's militia, particularly now, even if the DPP wanted to, they've lost the legislative yuan. So there's no way they could push this through. Problem with that is that how do you defend Taiwan? I was up at the the most likely landing beaches, Red Beach, which is northwest of Taipei. It's almost perfect for an invasion. A container port there, so if you take that, you can sustain your assault. There's an airport, the main Taiwanese airport is on 12 kilometers down the beach. You've got a river estuary that leads right into central Taipei. And all this is on the China-facing coast, the closest point between mainland China and Taiwan. What are the beach defenses? Here in Korea, you've got caserns, razor wire, minefields, firing points, vehicle firing points. Here along Red Beach, this coastal strip, there's two bunkers. And one has tumbled into the sea. It's like 1940s technology. You drive down the estuary of the river right into central Taipei. There's no defense, at least no visible defense. It's extraordinary. So how do you defend Taiwan? The lesson from Ukraine is very, very clearly you defend urban centers. I don't need to remind you of the names of these cities, Severodonetsk, Bakhmut, Avdivka, Mariupol. And these became meat grinders for the Russian army. And these are small towns. So if you want to defend Taiwan and you can't hold the enemy on the beaches, you withdraw into into the city and you fight there. That city is about the same size as Kiev. But how do you defend the city? You need a citizen's militia. And I was astonished that I heard argument after argument after argument There's no way we can stand up a militia. And these were largely political arguments. But to reassure your American listeners, there clearly is an interest in civil defense. I visited the uh, the Kumar Academy, which is now quite famous, been in business for the last two years. This is a group of people, they're both military and disinformation specialists, who are teaching Taiwanese how to defend themselves. Survival, medical, anti-disinformation, and so on. But they admit they can't teach actual civil defense because nobody has a weapon. So to me, the intellectual defense of Taiwan, the political defense of Taiwan, the social defense of Taiwan is extremely firm. I didn't even speak to any KMT voters who wanted unification with Taiwan. Everyone recognizes there are two Chinas, two completely different political systems. So ideologically, intellectually, the Taiwanese are are ready to defend. Physically, I'm not so sure. The government of the United States of America acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. Both believe that normalization of Sino-American relations is not only in the interest of the Chinese and American peoples, but also contributes to the cause of peace in Asia and in the world. Carla Freeman, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to be here. Been a couple of years. Matter of fact, uh, when I launched this thing in early 2021, the first episode I did about China... You were my guest. Oh, what an honor. Thank you. Uh, That's great to know. So for any of my newer listeners who want to go all the way back into the archive, something like uh, 270 episodes ago. But anyway, it is good to have you back to talk about the consequences or the significance of Taiwan's election. But we're going to start in the past a little bit because we're looking at this election today as really a referendum on Taiwan's democracy, its future. So why don't we start post-1949? Has it been the aim of the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, to reunite Taiwan with the mainland or what was called liberation at that point, liberating Taiwan from the nationalists? Absolutely. The uh, island of Taiwan was made the new capital in Taipei of the nationalist government, the government that the CCP, the communists, toppled to set up the People's Republic of China in 1949. And so the presence of the nationalists on Taiwan meant that the civil war wasn't over, uh, that this piece of territory that both the nationalists, the Kuomintang, now 
the KMT, we usually call it, and the CCP both claimed as part of China. In fact, Taiwan uh, has been attached to uh, a government in China during different moments in history, but it had been previously uh, until the end of the Second World War under Japanese control for some time. Yeah. So uh, we have this situation where you had a civil war in play. Both Mao Zedong on the Chinese mainland side and Chiang Kai-shek then in his new capital in Taipei claimed that they were the rightful governments of China. Yeah, my next question was going to be, that attitude went both ways across the Taiwan Strait, because in the early days after the Chinese Civil War, the Kuomintang, as you said, moved to Taiwan. The idea was, well, this government under Mao is not going to last very long, and we'll be able to return to the mainland and kick the commies out and take over again. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so the nationalists were preparing to do that and were, were arming and training, maintaining a, a really a government under military rule in, in Taiwan in order to continue their effort to restore their political control of all of China. That didn't happen. <laughs> the, the, the communists lasted longer than the nationalists believed or hoped back in the 1950s. Taiwan did stay under military dictatorship under Chiang and his son, an authoritarian government up through the mid-1980s. It was not a democracy. How would you describe the relationship between communist China and authoritarian Taiwan during these decades up to the mid-1980s? Was it hostile it was entirely hostile. These were two warring parties, and they periodically would exchange fire, triggering a number of crises across the Taiwan Strait involving efforts by the two sides to uh, make headway toward uh, unification or reunification, uh, depending on, on your perspective. This was a very hostile, militarized situation. Yeah, I mentioned Chiang Kai-shek, who we all know from our history lessons about World War II, and then his son. He appointed his son to take over for him. So Taiwanese politics starts to open up in the mid-'80s, early-1990s, free press, free elections. What caused that to begin? There are a bunch of different stories about how Taiwan democracy was born, but it was connected, I think, to the general wave of democratization around the world, uh, different shifts in control, the waning of the, the Cold War, and I think, ironically, perhaps even some relaxation across the strait as a result of a positive U.S.-China relations. In Taiwan, the Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, now the governing party, uh, William Lai, Lai ching was just elected to a third term of that party's uh, control of the presidency in, in Taiwan. Uh, that party was formed in, I think, 1986, and it was formed as a pro-democracy party. There are other factors. There's, there were social movements. Women's movement on Taiwan was very important. Environmental movement. Lots of different pressures for democracy. A key point, too, is that uh, Chiang Kai-shek's son, whom you mentioned, Jiang Jinghua, ultimately did not decide, this is, this is a person who had, had formerly run the de facto Gestapo, decided not to shut down the DPP, the, this new party, but rather let it live. And there are lots of speculation and, and different historical perspectives on why he did that. But that enabled the emergence of this democracy party, was able to organize and, and impel forward a democratic change on, the, on Taiwan. And I blew right by an important event or a series of developments. We don't have to uh, linger on it for long, but I should mention, in the 1970s is when Nixon makes the opening to China. There can be no stable and enduring peace without the participation of the People's Republic of China and it's 750 million people. This ultimately leads to normalization of relations with China, U.S.-China relations in the late 1970s. 1979, Washington switches diplomatic recognition to Beijing from Taipei. But at that same time, the U.S. Congress passes the Taiwan Relations Act, promising to help the island defend itself. So you were right about 1986. That is when the DPP is 
reformed after Chang pledges political reform, including a free press, lifting bans on new political parties and street protests, and then the dissidents form the DPP. And I must thank Reuters. I found an article with an excellent timeline to help me get through this with you, Carla Freeman. (laughs) But the point here is this democratization is underway at this point. And the U.S. is not recognizing Taiwan anymore as China because Taiwan's official name was Republic of China. Actually, it still is. Recognition is now with the mainland, but what's going on in Taiwan is still important. How does China respond to these democratic developments? Well, not very happily. The PRC government had at least a shared perspective with the KMT on Taiwan that there was just one China. And suddenly you have the emergence of a new democratic party that is uh, pro-Taiwan sovereignty, if not independence from the mainland. And you also have the election in the early 1990s of a president born on Taiwan, and he represents a whole new direction. He's, He's, of course, elected as representative of the KMT, but he's a very different figure from Chiang Kai-shek or his son, Jiang Jingwa. Uh, Suddenly, you have a democratically elected president on Taiwan. This is a major turning point in uh, cross-strait relations. And Beijing is watching the United States and its support for the island very, very carefully. And we end up at this point to preserve peace in the strait. We have to keep saying on all sides We are going to to do our best to uphold peace and not adjust the status quo. The status quo uh, is a very important concept in cross-strait relations, and it relates to not rocking the boat, essentially, that the CCP doesn't decide to use force against Taiwan, and the Taiwanese don't declare de jure independence. Yeah, because they're de facto independent now. But uh, before we get to what's going on today, I do want to share a headline that you might even see today. (laughs) The United States had to send ships to the Taiwan Strait in 1996 after, as you said, Taiwanese voters had their first direct election of a president. His name was Li Tanghui. Am I getting that right? China had been menacing Taiwan with war games to intimidate the Taiwanese, at least. Li Tanghui, he was a nationalist or was he a DPP? He was not a DPP. He was a, he was a nationalist. He was elected under the ROC constitution, changes to the constitution that allowed for the election of a president. This was a major turning point for, for cross-strait relations, as I said. The actual crisis between the U.S. And, and China over this that is sometimes called the third Taiwan Strait crisis happened over the question of Li's ability to travel to the United States, given that the United States recognized the the PRC as the legitimate government of China. And so the cross-strait crisis occurred over a period of time, but in 1995-96, it really nearly brought uh, the United States and China to war over over Taiwan. And when we say nationalists, it's with a capital N. (laughs) That's right. That's a Kuomintang. (laughs) That's the name of their party. And uh, this is the period where we basically have a two-party system, would you say, in Taiwan, one that is more pro-autonomy or anti-Beijing, more pro-Western, the DPP, versus the Kuomintang, which is not pro-China, but they're more conciliatory toward Beijing. Can you describe the dynamic between the two parties and whether it still exists in that same form today? Taiwan actually is a, has more than just two parties, and sometimes third parties play an important role, as, as they did in the latest election. But these are the two main parties, the DPP and the, and the KMT, or Guomindang, also translated as nationalists, as you said, with, a, with the capital. And the two parties have very different perspectives on the status of Taiwan. The Guomindang party originated in Uh, mainland China and shares the same, has historically shared the same view as the PRC, that Taiwan is part of China. And so that has been the basis for the two parties to communicate. And uh, they have had dialogues over the years and during periods when a nationalist president has been in power, as there was after 2008 for two terms, uh, Ma Yingjiu, the PRC, and the government in Taipei were able to have regular dialogues 
build uh, stronger cross-strait economic ties and so on, on the basis of this common understanding that the people on the both sides of the strait are Chinese. That's a very different view from the DPP, which sees Taiwan as having a separate history, a separate identity, its own sovereignty, popular sovereignty, particularly under democratic rule. But the nationalists don't want to give up the trappings of independence that Taiwan has earned, do they? Not at all. And and in fact, in this latest election, you really see an articulation by the nationalists of the need to defend, to emphasize deterrence and defense of Taiwan from the mainland and a desire to uphold the current status quo, whereby the island is self-governing. There's a real shift from the conciliatory approach that uh, previous KMT leaders have taken vis-a-vis the mainland. And as you mentioned, Ma Ying Zhou, he did win the presidency as a nationalist in 2008, 58 percent of the vote because the DPP incumbent had been wracked by uh, corruption allegations. And also there were some economic problems in those days. His name was Chen. He was later arrested. And then in 2010, as you said, uh, there was an economic rapprochement with China, a landmark trade deal that dropped tariffs on hundreds of products. Uh, Ma won a second term in 2012, but now we have a third consecutive victory by the DPP. So this is very healthy democracy with the parties exchanging periods in power. Uh, What is the significance of this most recent election? We finally got to to present times here, Carla Freeman. (laughs) Uh, Yes, this is a very important election, not only for the reason that you mentioned, it's a third term for the DPP, a pretty young party in a young democracy. The election of the DPP is, many people would would say, is a vote for Taiwan's democracy. The uh, KMT candidate had portrayed the election as a choice between war and peace, a language that really echoed the language that the mainland was using, that the PRC was using to uh, criticize the DPP and to try to interfere in the election. And so you have a party now that comes out of Taiwan democratic roots governing the island for a third term. To keep China at arm's length rather than what the KMT, the nationalists, may want to do. Our reporter here at The Washington Times, based in Seoul, who covered the elections in Taiwan, Andrew Salmon, tells me it's not just Taiwan that's trying to keep China at arm's length. Uh, South Korea, Japan, others have seen their relationship with China sour in recent years after so much promise in the late 90s, early aughts. I think Xi Jinping has taken a much more assertive approach to China's sovereignty issues in the region. And with now the world's largest navy at his disposal, he's been able to make the PRC a much bigger military presence in the region. And that has alarmed not only people in Taiwan, but also people around the region. And the United States uh, has critical allies and partners in the region, and they have become much more concerned about China, and that's become common ground for a stronger alliance. One more question about what's going on inside Taiwan before I return to the global implications of what's happening here. Uh, The election also turned on economic concerns, right? And can you talk a little bit about the emergence of this third party, the Taiwan People's Party, a more populist party that apparently a lot of young Taiwanese voted for? Yeah, this is a party that has built itself as as a pragmatic party. It has offered a third way uh, that has, as you said, appealed to young people on Taiwan who are very concerned about rising housing prices, uh, lack of employment opportunities, and were frustrated by the KMT's conservative approach to, to politics and not confident in the DPP's ability to uh, shift uh, the country in a new economic direction after eight years of some difficult economic times. So I think they were looking for some new leadership, and and they gave a lot of their votes uh, to uh, Ke Wanzhou, the leader of the TPP. He came in at 26.5%, I think, of the total vote in the presidential election. And then uh, his party won eight critical seats in the legislative yuan, in the in the legislature or parliament. So the TPP is a is an important political force, and and some people are describing Ko as as the kingmaker because he will be able to influence legislative decisions that are really important, like 
how big uh, Taiwan's military budget is going to be. Yeah, to be sure, none of these parties was calling for an end to Taiwanese democracy. It's all about how the winner approaches the relationship with China and how that relationship will influence Taiwan's de facto independence. So, you know, I often take to task on this podcast, Carla, Western commentators, intellectuals, historians, political scientists, whoever, who make every development or event in any country anywhere about us, right? But this election did have global implications. Do you agree with that? And what are those? Yeah, I think it it does have global implications. There's the Taiwan democratization story. It's a really important uh, story and, and uh, symbolically important in a region that is going to be the most dynamic economic area in the future and, and driving growth. Uh, we've seen setbacks for democracies around the world. And the fact that Taiwan's democracy has prevailed even under the stresses and pressures that it's faced uh, from Beijing is striking. It's not too much to say that this election of a pro-democracy party uh, that had this played this important role on the island is not important for, uh, symbolically important for democracy around the world. And as you said, I do want to say that that all of the parties on Taiwan are pro-democracy. Yeah. Uh, but there is a concern that uh, the history of the Kuomintang, its cross-strait relations with the mainland, that it might be willing to engage in a compromise that could ultimately compromise Taiwan's ability to govern itself and, and yeah. thus erode its democracy. Because they saw what so, happened in Hong Kong, of course. Th- that's exactly right. And yeah. what happened in Hong Kong was certainly important to the success of the electoral success of the DPP on Taiwan because it issued this one country, two systems formula, uh, this idea of one China, the one China principle that had been a part of the uh, KMT's history. And we have to say, of course, that a big part of what's happening here is China has threatened war to reunify instead of unify, because if you say reunify, that means Taiwan has always been part of China, right? Reunify uh, Taiwan. Um, That's no small thing, whether they go through with that immediately in 10 years or 20 years, who knows? Uh, There's another issue here, too. I mean, the economics. Taiwan Semiconductor has a market capitalization of 526 billion with a b dollars on wall street microchips etc i mean this this is really important part of this whole dynamic that gets overlooked when we're always talking about just the political part of it yeah it's it's also remarkable that the, the taiwanese economy is one of the the most dynamic in the world and and that's partly because of high technology, including its semiconductor industry, which it just dominates the global uh, semiconductor supply chain. We're all dependent on Taiwan's production of the most advanced semiconductors. That includes uh, that includes China. China is desperately trying to come up with its own alternatives, but, uh, but even in those supply chains, uh, it relies on Taiwan. So some people describe the TSMC plant, the, the semiconductor plant in Taiwan, as, as a, its silicon shield. But the cost to the global economy of a cross-strait conflict would be huge uh, just for the impact on the semiconductor industry alone. Of course, there are other ways to dominate Taiwan or coerce Taiwan short of military intervention. But my final question to you, Carla Freeman, is what do you make of, well, Xi Jinping's vision, right, is to do this, reunite Taiwan with the mainland by a certain date? What do you make of all these threats about war? I mean, how possible is it that we could see a war here that, in my view, would be catastrophic? But I mean, no one listens to me about these things, so that's why I have you on the on the show. I still believe that Beijing would like to reunify, as you clarified. That that's the perspective in Beijing uh, with Taiwan peacefully, and has used a lot of techniques intervening in the election through disinformation, made a lot of efforts to try to pressure some kind of prostrate reconciliation that would bring Taiwan back into the PRC's, as this again is the PRC view, of its political fold. The danger is that some leader on Taiwan declares independence de jure, and that could catalyze conflict across the strait. That's when Xi Jinping would say to the world, I have no choice, because his 
mandate as the head of the CCP is to, his mission is to unify China, which he sees as including Taiwan and, and the, has said over and over again, Taiwan, the cross-strait issue is the core of the core uh, interest of the PRC. Yeah. This is so a political, is, historical, ideological commitment, which as it we It is know, a commitment. Yeah, yeah that yeah. goes back to the roots of the birth of the CCP as a political force in uh, mainland China. And by the way, I've said mainland a few times. I want to just clarify that I'm referring to the geography. I'm not making a political statement by using that term. Well, Carla Freeman, I appreciate that because we know in this conflict, as in so many others, it's not only what you say, it is also how you say it or what words you choose. On the next episode of History As It Happens. The economy, stupid. We'll speak to historian Nelson Lichtenstein about his fascinating new book about the Clinton economy, Changes in Global Capitalism That We Continue to Struggle With Today. That is next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 